Welcome back guys, I'm Mike Burroughs from Stanceworks and we are working on my K-Swap Ferrari Time Attack streetcar project. And in the last episode I mentioned that I need an intermediate shaft coming out of the transmission so that I can properly center the motor. It's what's going to help us define exactly where the middle of it is so that our axles are equal length. And that's important, we can't really build engine mounts until we do that. However, getting that intermediate shaft is way harder than I thought it would be. Uh, it turns out as a Honda part, I can't get it from AutoZone, can't get it from O'Reilly's, can't get it from any of the local parts store chains, can't get it from the Honda dealership, can't get it from anywhere. I've had to order it online. It ain't gonna be here today. So we are taking a break from the back of the car. We are moving up front. We talked about pop-up headlights in the last episode and that was a ton of fun. You guys had emotions all across the board. Everything from loving the stock stuff to loving the idea of locking them down permanently and doing something hidden in the grill. Some of you guys like the idea of doing kind of a low profile pop up with like an LED strip or something like that. And I've made my decision. I know what I want to do. So we're going to dive into that. We've also got radiator and fuel cells to talk about. And I also bought a new tool, so I'm excited to show you guys that as well. Last but not least, I did start a Patreon page for those of you that want to find another way to support this channel. And I've gone out of my way to try to make sure each of the tiers are really kind of worth something, not just some hollow gesture. There's everything from early access to the Stanceworks podcast episodes before they go up and go live, which we're recording right now. We've also got early access to Stanceworks merchandise when it comes back. If you want to make sure that you get your size or you know, whatever it is that you might want before anybody else can. There's also discount codes, behind the scenes content. I'll be showing you guys parts and pieces for the car when they show up, you know, well before episodes get filmed. And just kind of interact with you guys there and, and kind of give an, you know, just a behind the scenes look at what's going on here in the shop. Get feedback about upcoming episodes, all sorts of teasers, that kind of stuff. So check out all the tiers. All the information is in the link in the description below. Let me know what you guys think. And with that said, I'll quit yapping. Let's actually work on this car. I suppose it's worth explaining my overall headlight choice while you guys watch me take this thing apart. I know I touched on it a bit, but honestly, I feel like doing some sort of like fixed headlight or just slimline pop-up will take away from what a 308 is really supposed to look like. And while I'm building a heavily modified one, I still want this car to look like a 308. That's pretty important to me. It's after all why I chose this car. I think it's one of the most beautiful ones ever made. And so I think taking away from the headlights and the way they look while closed, which is how the car was designed by Pin and Farina, takes away from what it is essentially supposed to be. As far as taking the headlights apart, this is relatively simple work, but I'm approaching it with the same philosophy as always because I have no idea how they actually come apart. And this is just sort of a dive in and explore and figure it out as I go. I pulled the front fascia and then the headlamp and then worked on pulling the bucket, which pivots on two bolts and then is actuated by a motor along with a linkage that pushes the unit up and down. Once I got that linkage off, the bucket itself came out, although it was a bit of a figure it out process to get it out because of the tolerances. It was kind of like one of those old fashioned physical mechanical puzzles. Once the bucket was out, it was a matter of taking the actual brace and motor itself out. And this was really easy to do. It was just one 10 millimeter volt on each corner. The bracket and motor also lifted up and out of the headlight hole. It's pretty effortless. All this stuff came out and as imagined, there's a lot of structure down in here. Uh, surprise, surprise. I imagine I'm probably gonna remove one of these braces. Having both in here with no headlamp is just really overkill. The only thing this is supporting is the outside of the car in case there's an accident and we don't need that. Uh, but there's a chance I need to get rid of the wheel well, depending on how big of a tire we wanna run. It looks like it should probably clear. I know it's all black in there to you guys, but there's a chance we need to clear into this panel. So maybe I wind up taking this guy out that might make more sense. But either way, we'll figure it out. Maybe I pull both out. Maybe I decide I don't need either of these because technically this is all box steel tube here coming over and it's just supporting the outside fender. I can add some support to this if I need to. And without it, removing this stuff, I'm starting to like this idea. There's so much room here for 
uh, kind of cooling capacity if I want to put an auxiliary cooler here or anything like that. So maybe I explore that idea. Let me know what you guys think. All right, let's pull out this other side and then we'll put them on the workbench. I'll show you guys what we've actually removed. I suppose I am getting a bit ahead of myself talking about secondary coolers, auxiliary coolers, things like that, because some of this room underneath this headlight is going to be taken up by a new headlight design, maybe some sort of old projector or headlight housing that needs to go in this front grill or mouth of the car. In order to have headlights, because I do want this car to be legal, that's definitely going to be necessary to have room for it. I know some of you guys are concerned about the headlight height legal requirements of the car, but trust me, that is the last thing I'm concerned about getting pulled over for. So as you guys just saw, I weighed everything and kind of have everything laid out. So we've got two of each of these components off of the car, except for the horn. There's only one of those. But in total, this stuff weighs 29 pounds. That's for both sides together, not just one. But that means we've lost about 30 pounds from the front of the car, which I'm quite happy with. That's a big chunk of weight. Brings us down to about, at this point, we're probably right around 1,100 pounds, probably maybe 1,120 uh, as the car sits. So I'm pretty, pretty happy with that. Uh, these headlight surrounds weren't really all that heavy. They are steel, uh, but not very heavy. The headlamps themselves, they are glass with metal housings. These things weighed a couple of pounds. The real weight is in the steel mount and the motor. Uh, this whole assembly was just shy of eight pounds per side. And surprisingly, the cover portion is pretty heavy too. There's a lot of metal here. It is all steel um, and is pretty stout in construction. I mean, it does need to withstand, you know, high speed air, not trying to blow it back or fold it open or anything like that. It needs to be able to support the headlight. Uh, so these things are pretty heavy. I will probably wind up cutting this apart. I might even try to like make a composite version of just the cover of this so that we can get rid of the steel altogether. And we will do some sort of low profile mount uh, to mount it into the car. I didn't weigh the fender vents themselves because I don't think anybody makes a lightweight version of those and they're definitely gonna make it. I'm not really too worried about the weight of them. But overall, I, I am happy with the decision. I think that this is gonna be the right choice to keep the car looking the way that I want it to look. I think doing some sort of, you know, other headlight solution is gonna wind up making it look like it's a Grand Theft Auto V, you know, royalty-free version of a 308 as opposed to an actual Ferrari. Now, let's go up to the front and let's talk about radiators and fuel cells. You guys have left a ton of comments in the last episode, a lot of them about pop-ups, but a lot of them throwing out suggestions for this car, and I'm really appreciative of it. I love that you guys are kind of throwing your ideas out there and contributing thoughts, you know, saying, hey, what about an NSX fuel cell, an MR2 fuel cell, things like that. A lot of you guys have said, why don't you do the fuel tank in the front of the car? And there is a very good reason it will not fit. Let me show you. What I have here is a CSF radiator core, and it is from a former project that didn't get finished, but this is more or less the size of an E30 radiator. It is nothing special, it is not huge. It might look big sitting here, but it is not a big radiator. Relatively small one, actually. If we put it in the front of the Ferrari, you're gonna remember just how small this car really is. It is Miata-sized. It looks bigger because it's up on wood and we're always sitting in the engine bay, but this is a very small car. There's not much room in it. The front of this car originally held a car battery and a spare tire, and that's it. We've got two coolers to put up front. If I set the radiator into the car, height-wise, you can get an idea of what we're working with. Now, the original radiator sat completely vertically and it's only like a foot tall. This car has a very low profile in the front. It can't hold very much radiator. So we're gonna lean the radiator back and do what's called a V-mount and angle it at about a 45 degree incline. And it's actually gonna be a bit more than this. I wanna try to fit more radiator. We can actually swing the back of that up and take it all the way back to about this point, back to here. It'll probably match the incline of the chassis. And overall, that's gonna allow us to fit the biggest radiator that we can, and then we will also build this out to be full width within the car. 
Some of you guys might be wondering, why do you need such a big radiator? And that's because cooling a race car is difficult and cooling a very high horsepower turbocharged race car is that much more so. And I don't wanna say what power figure I'm gonna do yet, but plenty of you guys know the Model A and you know how much power it makes. This will be my most powerful car yet. So cooling is gonna be huge in demand and it's gonna be a challenge. We need to cool this car as well as we can. We're gonna need as much radiator in the front of it as we can possibly fit. If we kind of swing this down to give as much of an idea as we can of what might be up here, something more like that, it'll, it'll be pitched up a bit more, but something to this effect, you get an idea of how quickly we consume this space in the front of the car. Now, plenty of you guys may remember that I also want to use water to air intercooling on this car, and that's because the power level that I want to achieve is going to have, once again, really high cooling demands. And what I want to do for that is stack a second cooler behind this, more kind of flat behind the radiator, and then have a heat extractor coming out of the hood, a hood vent. So overall, we're very quickly going to consume all available space in the front of this car. Putting a fuel cell up here will not work. There is just not room for it in any regard. With that second cooler in place, you really get an idea of what's going to happen to the front of the car. A lot of you guys have expressed fears about the dynamics of the car and wanting to get the fuel cell weight up front. And trying to condense this down so I don't wind up just talking through this entire episode, it is a backwards approach because we have removed almost all of the weight from this car from the back end. It's currently like a 70% front weight bias and we want to make sure that we don't make the front too heavy. The problem right now is that if we put this entire car back together as it was with only an engine swap, no weight loss anywhere, it would be front heavy. And so I'm trying to be weight conscious about the front and I promise you guys, don't worry too much about it yet. All right, with that all finished, let's move on to this guy. Last week, Andrew and I went to Santa Ana and I found this thing and we recorded the whole process of unloading it from the truck with my new gantry. Check it out. Yeah, it needs to be high enough that it does actual work. Or just hook it and then drive away. There we go. Let's see what let's see what happens.
Imagine if we had that thing when we bought the Coke machine. Oh my god. I don't have to sweat moving the Coke machine again. Actually, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> Before showing this thing off, I really wanted to clean it up so I could share it in all its glory as it's a really nice machine. I mentioned in a previous episode that I missed having one of these, especially since Riley has taken his with him when he moved out and back north to Sacramento. And once I realized one was missing from my life, it was quickly pushed to the top of the list of tools I need to go out and find. So now that it's all cleaned up, I want to give you guys kind of the overall tour of this thing, show you what kind of shape it's in. It's a DY400 Sawmaster, apparently built in Nebraska. It's got the saw or the saw blade welder on it, saw blade grinder. We've got some outlets, we've got lighting, and obviously the bandsaw itself. And this thing is honestly in amazing shape. I really think that it's barely been used. It's just been pushed around a shop for most of its life. It was built in 1979. I got it for cheap because the guy that I bought it from thought it was a three phase machine. And turns out that it is just single phase 220. It's got a pretty big two horsepower motor down here in the bottom with a four speed transmission on it. So it's got four different speeds for the blade itself. And you guys saw me wipe down the inside, but it's in amazing shape in here. I mean, this thing is just incredible. You can see why I don't think it was used very much at all. I really hardly, you know, cleaned anything out of it. So needless to say, I am quite pumped to have this thing in the tool arsenal at this point. It's gonna be a great addition. This weekend, I'm gonna have to uh, wire up a new plug on it and put a new outlet on the wall so we can plug it in. I did get to see it run when I bought it, but I haven't got to use it for myself yet. But with the fabrication I'm hoping to get done this weekend, we will definitely put it to work. All right, I'm calling it done there. I appreciate you guys watching as always. I apologize that most of this episode was just kind of talking about the car. I know nothing interesting really happened, but I'm mostly just stalling until I get that intermediate shaft tomorrow. It's really holding me up, but I'm eager to dive back into the fabrication back here and get this thing partially mounted up if I get lucky this weekend. Anyways, I will catch you guys on Tuesday. On Sunday, if everything goes well, I've got a bonus episode that I recorded last weekend that I'm hoping I will post up. So keep an eye out on Sunday morning. If it pops up, you know everything went according to plan. As always, thank you. I will catch you guys on Tuesday.